There are arguably no other families on the first families of Virginia list as important as the Harrisons, while also having as little verifiable information written about their founding. Perhaps that's an over-the-top claim, but for as important as this family was in creating Virginia and influencing the United States, there are no standalone volumes written about their establishment, and the many genealogies to be found can be quite confusing, especially how often names like Benjamin and Thomas were used. That all being said, paucity of information is part of the Harrison origin story that is in a way very different than other names on the first family of Virginia list. For years, an abundant and often repeated myth stated that Virginia's cavalier influx brought over aristocratic Englishmen. While in some cases that's true, in others, such as the Harrison story, it is not. There is a story that tries to link the Harrisons to Viking royalty predating England's Norman conquest, but verifying authenticity is impossible. At best, the Harrisons might have emerged from the English gentry class. Whatever the case may be, this family quickly established itself and can rightly claim at least two United States presidents, and maybe at least one more, in her genealogy. What might also be in the Harrison line, depending upon which sources are credible or not, is a regicide named Thomas Harrison, who was a friend of Oliver Cromwell, though most historians don't give any credence to this story. There are even connections to Bermuda, as a John Harrison served as the island's governor in the 1620s. Though their American story begins somewhat foggy, by the late 17th century, there is no denying that the Harrison name was well established, and it would leave an indelible imprint upon Virginia's and later America's story. From what we know, the Harrison name is first seen in Virginia's annals as early as 1619 when Opie Cancano complained about an Ensign Harrison who commanded one of John Martin's shallops and stole corn from the Powhatan tribes. No one knows exactly what became of that Harrison with any certainty, but it's possible that he was numbered among the 350 who died during the 1622 massacre. He also might have been the same Waraskoyak dwelling Harrison who owned a house in which a son, as well as Ralph and Thomas Haymore, fought to defend during that infamous Powhatan attack. For whatever reason, only Harrison's son is mentioned. Was the elder Harrison killed in the initial wave of assaults? Perhaps. If he didn't die during that attack, he might have been the same George Harrison that historian Edward Neal documents as having been killed by Councilmember Richard Stevens in Virginia's first recorded duel. Yes, that Richard Stevens the one who had his teeth knocked out by Governor John Harvey's cudgel in their 1630s fight for colonial control. George Harrison had 200 acres of land patented in his name, making up today's Claremont, as it was renamed by later owner William Allen in honor of Queen Victoria's birthplace. We don't see the Harrison name again until 1634, when a Benjamin Harrison was also granted 200 acres of land near what was called Waraskoyak Creek, today's Pagan River. This first Benjamin Harrison is named in the 1639 assembly as a Burgess and had apparently been clerk of the court for almost two decades by that time, which means that he'd been around since at least 1620. He was still on the scene in 1642 for William Berkeley's arrival and remained a part of Berkeley's government seemingly until his apparent 1649 death. The next brief Harrison snippet we see directly involves Governor Berkeley. Benjamin Harrison potentially had four other brothers, Richard, 
Thomas, Nathaniel, and Edward. Edward didn't come to the New World, but Richard, Thomas, and Nathaniel did. Thomas joined his brother in coming to Virginia, while it seems that the other two sailed to New England and settled into the Connecticut and Massachusetts colonies. In 1640, Thomas moved just south of Benjamin into the Nansman River area associated with a strong Puritan enclave. He said that he wanted to preach the gospel to the Nansman tribe, which he did for a time, before serving at the Elizabeth River Parish in today's Norfolk. He was an early supporter and friend of Governor Berkeley, but sympathies with the Puritans drove a wedge between the governor and preacher. Governor Berkeley's poor, though somewhat understandable for the time period, decision to silence all Puritan ministers in the colony turned former friends into enemies. Thomas, his personal chaplain, was no exception. By 1646, the issue had spread the length of the Atlantic seaboard across to Bermuda and back to England, where powerful Puritans like the Earl of Warwick raised the standard against Berkeley. Bermuda's Puritan Governor Sale visited his Virginia brethren in 1646 and invited them to immigrate to his island colony. However, when Massachusetts Bay Governor John Winthrop caught wind of the invitation, he voiced his concerns. Thomas Harrison, who was part of the discussion taking place between both men and Virginia's Puritans, responded by essentially saying, Until God tells us to leave, we're going to continue worshiping and serving him here in Virginia. Berkeley didn't like that stance, and in 1647, he and his government increased the penalties levied against nonconforming ministers in an attempt to curtail their livelihood. But Harrison and his Puritan friends had strong allies among the parliamentarians who by that time gained the upper hand during the English Civil War. The Earl of Warwick, chief among Harrison's supporters, sent many letters across the Atlantic approving and supporting Virginia's Puritan community. Harrison even mentions this support to Governor Winthrop in a 1648 letter by saying, That golden apple, the ordinance of toleration, is now fairly fallen into the lap of the saints. No more compelling men to go to the parish churches, or to sacrifice abomination of their souls, or to offer up the sacrifice of fools, and yet all such as preach, print, or practice anything contrary to the known fundamentals of religion, the peace of state, or power of godliness, are excluded from the sweetness of this indulgence. Concerning ourselves, we have received letters full of life and love from the Earl of Warwick, who engageth himself to the uttermost to advance the things of peace and welfare. And the Prince of Peace himself hath hitherto been so tender to us, that he hath not suffered any opposition yet to fall amongst us, a matter of no small admiration considering where we dwell, even where Satan's throne is. Seventy-four have joined here in fellowship, and nineteen stand propounded, and many more of great hopes and expectations. But Berkeley's pressure started showing by 1648. Many of Virginia's Puritans moved northward into Maryland, where religious toleration allowed dissenters to worship according to their conscience before God. Key among those leaving Virginia during this time were former Virginia Governor Richard Bennett and William Stone, brother to the Maryland Governor Thomas Stone. Thomas Harrison also left Virginia in 1648, but he planned to return. Plans changed during his Boston visit, however. He met Dorothy Simmons, fell in love, and married her in December of that same year as Governor Winthrop's sister Lucy Downing related to her brother in a letter. You hear, I believe our cousin Dorothy Simmons is now one and wedded to Mr. Harrison, the Virginia minister. Rather than returning to Virginia, Thomas and his new wife Dorothy stayed in Boston for the next two years before they left the colonies behind altogether. The married couple established themselves in Puritan England before Dorothy died and Thomas became associated with Henry Cromwell. Cromwell and Harrison soon moved to Ireland, where Thomas married second wife Catherine Bradshaw and fathered a son named Isaiah. In 1687, Isaiah Harrison seems to have left Ireland behind in exchange for Oyster Bay, New York, just across the Long Island Sound from his Connecticut kinfolk. The Harrisons remained on Long Island for decades before moving southward into Delaware, and finally the Shenandoah Valley in the 1730s. This being the case, two distinct Harrison lines formed in Virginia by the early 18th century, the so-called James River Harrisons and the Shenandoah Valley Harrisons. Both lines impacted the colony and later U.S. history tremendously, as we shall see.
Benjamin Harrison, the James River Line's apparent patriarch, according to most sources, seems to have had at least four sons, three of them perhaps with Mary Storton, also known as Mary Sidway, due to her second marriage to Benjamin Sidway. The oldest child from the Harrison-Storton line, known to history as Benjamin Harrison II, is the only son we know much about. Maybe that's because he was in fact the only son the patriarch had. Either way, Benjamin Harrison II was a great mover and shaker during his time. This second Benjamin Harrison had to figure out life quickly, because his father died when the younger Benjamin was only about five years old. Nothing is known about young Benjamin's education, but he certainly learned how to run his father's approximately 500-acre Wakefield plantation very well. By the time Governor Berkeley returned to power in the 1660s, in fact, Benjamin Jr. showed himself to be an established, though teenaged, powerhouse. He wasn't a great planter, as is evident by his relatively small land holdings, but Benjamin II was a savvy businessman. This aided his rise throughout the 1660s and into the 18th century, the same time that most planters suffered due to the ill-affecting Navigation Acts. Harrison wasn't hurt by the Navigation Acts, and in fact used their negative influence to his benefit by opening warehouses to hold and sell outgoing commodities. This allowed planters to buy some time in order for their crops to fetch the best prices available, which weren't always just after harvest. In such a venture, Harrison became a popular figure in Virginia's early economy, and that popularity brought beneficial connections with it. Benjamin II soon ascended through colonial ranks from sheriff to burgess to speaker of the House of Burgesses and finally the governor's council. His rise was as impressive as that of the Lees and other immigrating families of the day. That being so, Harrison worked to solidify his family's position among Virginia's elite through marriage, not only personally, but by also marrying his children into other rising colonial families. Further aiding Harrison's situation was the shrewd choice to stick with Governor Berkeley during Bacon's Rebellion, for which Harrison was rewarded in land such as Berkeley Plantation, formerly owned by the disgraced Giles Bland, Nathaniel Bacon's ally. Benjamin married Hannah Churchill, with whom he fathered at least five children, according to most sources, and all of those descendants are found among Virginia's highest society. Their lives intertwined together as they worked to elevate the Harrison name, and arguably none of those children was more important than Benjamin's son that historians have named Benjamin III, though all of Benjamin and Hannah's children played important roles during the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries. Trade and political connections made Benjamin and Hannah's progeny very eligible, especially as Harrison land holdings increased throughout the colony. Among those five children were Benjamin III, Nathaniel, Sarah, and Hannah. Benjamin III married Elizabeth Burwell from the Middle Plantation's well-established Burwell family. We'll talk more about the Burwells, or Burls as Virginians call them, another time. But suffice it to say for now, Elizabeth's father was Louis Burwell II, owner of Gloucester's Fairfield Plantation, making him a quite respectable member of Virginia's growing upper class. Benjamin III predeceased his father in 1710 but they worked in tandem to elevate the Harrison name beyond their already elevated position. For instance, Benjamin II seems to not have purchased much land, comparatively speaking, during his lifetime having paid taxes on only 2,900 acres in 1705, while other prominent landholders paid taxes on much vaster acreage. On the other hand, Benjamin III had considerably more land than his father at that same time, owning 7,000 acres in 1705, and then 20,000 at the time of his 1710 death. The combination of land and his father's connections made this Harrison extremely powerful, even to the point of standing down a colonial governor. While Benjamin II enjoyed considerable authority under a series of governors after Sir William Berkeley, that situation began changing under Governor Francis Nicholson, and part of that change involved his son Benjamin III. Francis Nicholson had been in Virginia since 1690, and was highly influential during his short tenure as Lord Effingham's lieutenant governor. During this period, Nicholson could boast his being one of the main founders of the College of William and Mary, even being named one of the college's original trustees. In fact, a building was named for him, Nicholson Hall, on William and Mary's campus. Nicholson's tenure as lieutenant governor ended in 1692 when Effingham resigned his post. But that didn't end Nicholson's colonial work. He had hoped to gain Effingham's seat, 
but a power struggle saw him lose out to Sir Edmund Andros. He was slighted, but not finished. Instead of being named Virginia's new governor, Nicholson moved northward and took Maryland's highest office, but not before Andros was asked to stand in for Nicholson, since Nicholson was in England during Maryland's 1693 court session. Andros took a 500-pound payment for his work, which emptied Maryland's coffers, a situation Nicholson discovered upon his 1694 arrival in Maryland. The two governors then fought over the sum until 1696, when the Board of Trade ordered Andros to pay back 300 pounds. Nicholson, however, remained bitter and sought to undo his neighboring governor. To do this, he worked hand-in-glove with Commissary James Blair, founder of the College of William and Mary, to unseat Andros in 1698, which allowed Nicholson to finally attain Virginia's governorship. But undermining Andros came at a price, even though Andros himself was unpopular among Virginia's elite. The actions between Andros and Nicholson put the governor's council on high alert, and it was no mean council. It included many of the leading families of the day, such as the Harrisons, who by this time were frosty toward both Nicholson and Andros. To illustrate this point, Nicholson asked to rent a Williamsburg home owned by Benjamin II, who priced the rental at 40 pounds a year. Nicholson, outraged with this price, moved into the College of William and Mary in a huff. Regardless of the slight, Nicholson still tried to pacify his leading council members by bestowing positions, such as Benjamin Harrison III's being elevated to the clerk of the council and his brother Nathaniel's being appointed naval officer. These offices were nice, but the real gifts were in land, and had been for decades before the turn of the 18th century. So, though offices were given, the first families simply acted independently of the governor, whether it was Nicholson, Andros, or another. Offices simply didn't strike their fancy the same way that land did. Harrison and other council members' infrequent attendance at governmental functions further rubbed Nicholson the wrong way, and the governor let his frustrations be known by outrageous name-calling. But such was the power of the Harrisons and other first families that they went on their business not paying attention to the crotchety crown representative, at first. Yet Nicholson wouldn't remain unheard. In 1702, the governor opened land to be sold around the Blackwater Swamp, exactly what the first families of Virginia wanted, and soon the Harrisons purchased the best land. Nicholson was incensed with the Harrisons and shut down sale of any further lands and opened an investigation to the Harrisons and related Burwell purchases. Part of this extended anger was due to Nicholson's legendary temper. He felt that his character was slighted after he fell in love with Lucy Burwell, Louis Burwell II's 18-year-old daughter, sister of Benjamin III's wife, Elizabeth. Burwell told Nicholson that Lucy wouldn't marry him. At the news, Nicholson left reason and began giving in to his temper. Emotions soon boiled over in that he began openly attacking Virginia's leading men, including the Harrisons, whom he deemed complicit in turning Lucy Burwell's heart away from him. He promised to kill anyone involved in Lucy's marrying another man, though Lucy did marry another. Edmund Berkeley by her own choice. Nicholson's friend James Blair counseled the governor against his violent outbursts, but the Harrison name extended even into this relationship in that Blair married Benjamin Harrison II's daughter, Sarah. Complications with this relationship as well as Blair's feeling slighted in his William and Mary venture created an irreparable rift between the former allies, and soon Nicholson had a falling out with Blair, which signaled the governor's imminent end in Virginia. Still more outbursts followed before his removal. Nicholson began working to curtail Harrison power in their own backyards of Surrey and James City. But the governor's actions hurt him and not the Harrisons, who, along with James Blair, turned Virginians against Nicholson in 1703. In the end, the governor's own council banded together and wrote Queen Anne about Nicholson's heavy-handed actions and requested his removal. The weight of three names, Carter, Harrison and Ludwell alone demanded such respect that London listened to the council's request. Nicholson was finally removed in 1705, and key to the governor's removal lay with Benjamin Harrison II and his son Benjamin III. Their skillful maneuvering, as well as strong family bonds created by intermarrying their children with other elite families, ensured Nicholson's downfall to their benefit. 
It wasn't long before Benjamin III began using his victories and secure position in the colony to settle larger land tracts, such as the former Berkeley Hundred, which was purchased from the Blands after Giles Bland was hanged for his part in Bacon's Rebellion. The Blands also owned Westover at this time, thus making the two major families neighbors for a short period, before Theodoric Bland sold Westover to William Byrd I and brought thus another powerful elite into the Harrison neighborhood. In addition to land, marriages, and standing against Governor Nicholson, Benjamin became an able legal mind, often being called the best legal mind in the colony of his time, which served him well during his political life. That political life saw Harrison serve as Virginia's Attorney General, Colonial Treasurer, and Speaker of the House of Burgesses before his untimely death at age 37 in 1710. Along with his father, Benjamin created a strong Harrison name that by themselves impacted Virginia's landscape, and that name carried into the next Harrison generations. Before we get into some of those highlights, let's take a look at some of Benjamin III's siblings and their connections. Benjamin III's brother, Nathaniel Harrison, wed Mary Carey from another important family of the era. His name alone meant that he would benefit from being related to both his father and brother. But Nathaniel was an impressive character in his own right. He was also involved in many of the same quarrels that undid Nicholson, and capitalized in much the same way as his siblings did, though perhaps not to the same extent as his older brother Benjamin had done. Nathaniel settled north of his father on another of Virginia's earliest patented lands, Brandon Plantation, which was purchased by Nathaniel in 1720. He and Mary had seven children before Nathaniel's 1727 death. Of those seven children, Colonel Nathaniel Harrison Jr. stands out in that his second marriage was to the distinguished colonial powerhouse Robert King Carter's daughter, Lucy. But that marriage didn't produce any children. Yet Nathaniel's first marriage to Mary Cole Diggs, daughter of Yorktown's Cole Diggs, yielded at least four children, most prominent of which was another Benjamin Harrison. This Benjamin married Evelyn Byrd, daughter of William Byrd III. Thus, by the late 18th century, one can see from just the briefest looks into the younger Harrison line just how interconnected Virginia's elite families had become as Harrisons married Carters, Diggs, and Byrds. The Harrisons also married into the Ludwell line. Benjamin II's daughter, Hannah, espoused Philip Ludwell Jr. in 1697. Ludwell was a son of Governor Berkeley ally, Carolina Governor Philip Ludwell Sr., and first wife, Lucy Higginson, before Philip Sr. married Berkeley's widow, Frances. Hannah and Philip bore distinguished figures such as Henry Harrison Ludwell, Hannah Harrison Lee, wife of Stratford Hall founder Thomas Lee, and Lucy Grimes, wife of Major John Grimes II, from yet another important Virginia family of the time. Notable Benjamin Harrison II progeny connections continue with the already mentioned Sarah Harrison, who married Commissary James Blair. This marriage is quite interesting in that Sarah proved to be a handful, not just for her husband, but other contemporary elites, such as colonial rake Daniel Park. Park hated James Blair and challenged the commissary to a duel but Blair's clergy status forbade his partaking in duels. So, one Sunday morning while Blair was preaching against adultery, an accusation that Sarah had leveled at Park, Park stormed into Williamsburg's Bruton Parish Church, violently pulled Sarah out of a pew that Park deemed his own, and proclaimed that she wasn't worthy of the seat in which she sat. Blair astonishingly, so the story goes, kept his head for the time being, and afterward wrote the proper English authorities, who obliged Blair's request to remove Daniel Park from the colony. Park, for his own part, died in the West Indies, but his story will have to wait for another time. Preceding Sarah and Daniel Park's confrontation was another interesting episode. This one was at her own marriage ceremony to Dr. Blair. 
When the betrothed pair stood before a Reverend Smith, who read from his prayer book the line, Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor him, obey? Sarah cut off the minister by saying, No, obey. Reverend Smith, shocked, tried to read through the line again, at which point Sarah once again, this time more firmly, said, No, obey. Smith and those in attendance were stunned, but Sarah refused to say the line, which prompted Smith to continue the service without having Sarah promise to obey her husband. No one knows, but it seems unlikely that Sarah did eventually obey. We do know that she continued to be a handful for James, who found little comfort or peace at home. The two had no children, and Sarah had a reputation for loving alcohol, which only added to her often odd behavior, making her one of Colonial Virginia's most colorful women. Sarah died young and was buried in the church graveyard on Jamestown Island. She still excites some interest today, because years after being laid to rest, a sycamore tree disturbed her resting place and grew through her grave, spawning many ghost stories which endure to this day. Let's now return to Benjamin Harrison III's lineage. He settled Berkeley Hundred and established a port at a location still bearing his name today, Harrison's Landing, which would also become part of a war campaign a century and a half later. He did build a home on the property, but it would soon be replaced a few years after Benjamin III died and he left the plantation to his son, Benjamin Harrison IV. The fourth Benjamin Harrison married just as elite as his other family members when he wed Anne Carter, daughter of King Carter, sometime in 1722. Four years later, Benjamin IV completed the magnificent manor house still standing at Berkeley Plantation today. Benjamin and Anne needed such a house both to show off the Harrison position as well as to house the ten children born to the couple. The Harrisons had indeed arrived by this point in their history. They were no longer just innovative warehouse keepers, shippers, and small planters on the James River. Now, they were as close to royalty as possible in Virginia's landscape, and Benjamin IV made sure everyone knew it. He had quite a few impressive examples to follow, his father and grandfather, as well as his father-in-law, the richest man of the age. To further exemplify the Harrison position, Anne and Benjamin's children fetched the highest possible matches available. Oldest daughter Elizabeth was the first to marry into the equally prominent Randolph family in 1746. Her husband Peyton Randolph was no small figure. He held many high offices and was in fact the first president of the Continental Congress before his 1775 death. Second daughter Anne married another Randolph, William Randolph III from the Turkey Island Randolphs, and owner of Wilton Plantation, then just south of Richmond's main hub. Another Benjamin, this one known as Benjamin V, was born in 1726, and followed in the long line of accomplished Benjamin Harrisons. He married into the Bassett family when he married Eltham Plantation owner William Bassett's daughter, Elizabeth, in 1748. Benjamin Harrison V ascended Virginia's highest office as the now Commonwealth's fifth governor in 1781. Before that time, Benjamin was a powerful presence during the American War for Independence, especially in that he signed the Declaration of Independence. Benjamin V and his wife Elizabeth's influence didn't end with their passing, as they gave birth to the United States' ninth president, William Henry Harrison, as well as Declaration of Independence signer Carter Bassett Harrison. Their close relationship with nearby Charles City dwellers, the Tyler family, served to leave an imprint upon early 19th century history but we'll devote more attention on them another time. Suffice it to say for now, William Henry was a frontier war hero where he earned the nickname Tippecanoe from his victory at the 1811 battle of the same name. He used that status to win the election of 1840 before he delivered the longest inauguration speech in American history, fell ill, and died one month into his presidency. Before that death, however, William Henry Harrison fathered Ohio Congressman John Scott Harrison, who subsequently gave birth to Union Brigadier General and 23rd U.S. President Benjamin Harrison in 1833. At that time, this made the Harrisons only the second family to have two members serving as U.S. President, the first being the Adams family. Carter Bassett Harrison, the lesser-known older brother of the ninth president, served a glittering career in Virginia politics, married into the Allen family, who ironically now owned Claremont, the same land patented by the Harrison Patriarch, 
and, as already mentioned, signed the Declaration of Independence with his father. Two other Randolphs married into Benjamin Harrison IV's family when Lucy married Edward Randolph Jr. and Carter Harrison married Isham Randolph's daughter, Susanna. Carter and Susanna's reach extended further westward as their son and grandson, Carter Henry Harrison III and Carter Henry Harrison IV, became Chicago governors during the 19th and early 20th centuries, respectively. The last child from Benjamin IV and Ann Carter's descendants that I'll mention was Nathaniel, who married nearby Charles City neighbor Edmund Ruffin's daughter, Mary. Counted among this line's descendants is one J. Hartwell Harrison, the famous doctor known for his part in performing the first successful organ transplant when he transplanted a kidney from Ronald Herrick to twin brother Richard in 1954. Let me mention that Dr. Harrison can also be claimed by the Shenandoah Valley Harrison line as well, which illustrates the tightly interconnected marriage situation among Virginia's elite families of that time. It could be argued that the Harrison influence reached its zenith in the early 19th century and began ebbing by the Civil War. Land holdings and family wealth had been spread far and wide across an almost innumerable sea of children. They intermarried with all of Virginia's elite families and boasted presidents in her ranks. James River Crown Jewels, Berkeley, as well as the Brandon Plantations and various others, such as Carter Bassett Harrison's Maycox, for example, testified of an important family's place within the Old Dominion. But as was the case with other first family of Virginia members, they were land-rich, though cash-poor. When debts began mounting throughout the 19th century, lands started exiting the family to pay off those accounts. The Civil War's impact exacerbated this effect and helped push the Harrisons' influence into the history books. Oddly enough, descendants from another Harrison branch appear to have aided the James River Harrison's descent. That other major Harrison branch, known as the Shenandoah Harrisons, descended from Benjamin I's brother Thomas, the aforementioned Governor Berkeley chaplain. Thomas's son Isaiah first married Elizabeth Wright while still living in New York, and the couple had five children together before Elizabeth died after bearing her last child, also named Elizabeth, in 1698. Two years later, Isaiah married second wife Abigail Smith and had five children of their own. They remained on Long Island until 1721, at which time Isaiah moved to his new acquisition, Maiden Plantation, in Delaware. It was here that the Harrisons met the Herring family, and two of their children married when Abigail Harrison wed Alexander Herring. Isaiah moved his family back into Virginia in 1737 when he patented land in the Shenandoah Valley. But before any land transactions were finalized, Isaiah died around 1738. His oldest son, Daniel, however, remained in the valley and purchased land along Cook's Creek, which eventually became today's Dayton, Virginia. While Daniel's brother, Thomas, moved a few miles northward and purchased 12,000 acres near the famous Spotswood Trail, so made famous by Governor Spotswood's Knights of the Golden Horseshoe Expedition. From this settlement that Thomas settled in the 18th century, he gifted land that comprises today's historic downtown Harrisonburg. A house known as the Thomas Harrison House still remains in the area and is said to have been built by Thomas in the 1750s. Daniel, Thomas, and a third brother, John, established themselves quite well in the valley between Dayton and Lacey Spring and their move proved brilliant. The brothers were savvy with their land purchases, given that they were along what became the Great Wagon Road. These Harrisons seem to have understood that Virginia and the fledgling United States future lay in the West, and many of the families who began pouring into the valley during this period were transient. Those transients traveled the Great Wagon Road, and many had to pass through Harrison land on their way allowing the Harrisons to make a profitable business helping settlers along their journey westward. 
Some of them were descendants from the formerly well-established first families, especially after tobacco had ravaged Tidewater's once prosperous farmlands. Tobacco soil depletion had forced the once wealthy to look elsewhere, which is what many Harrisons from the James River started to do about the turn of the 19th century. This is why men like William Henry and his sons settled into Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, thus leaving behind their ancestral homes along the James River. The Shenandoah Valley Harrisons played a major role in this migration, but they also had their hand in one other influential life. We've looked at the obvious Harrison presidents, William Henry and Benjamin, but there is another, less than obvious descendant from the Harrison line who reached the federal government's highest office. He wasn't Virginian per se, but his family roots are part of Virginia's history. That aforementioned marriage between Abigail Harrison and Alexander Herring produced Bathsheba Herring, who married Abraham Lincoln. No, not that Lincoln, but his grandfather. Bathsheba and Abraham had five children together, one of whom was Thomas, father of the 16th president. Most of the Lincolns remained just north of the Harrisonburg area in today's Linville, where a family homestead was built in the 1840s by Jacob Lincoln, after President Lincoln's family moved to Kentucky. We think of Lincoln as being from Illinois and Kentucky, and that's true, though Lincoln didn't move to Illinois until the 1820s, but his roots lie in Virginia, where the Shenandoah Valley Harrisons were part of his lineage. Before I close, I must briefly mention one other important Harrison line which seems to have no direct relation to either the James River or Shenandoah Valley lines, that of Burr Harrison, or the Harrisons of Northern Virginia as they are also sometimes called. Burr Harrison appears to have immigrated into Prince William County during the 1630s, about the same time as the other Harrisons were rising to prominence. He settled on the Chopawamsic Creek, part of today's Quantico Marine Base, and the family spread throughout northern Virginia. Descendants from this line include many children, some of whom married into powerful families like the Lees. They served during many of Virginia and the United States conflicts, as well as in Virginia's political bodies, most recently when Thomas Harrison and then his son Burr Powell Harrison represented northern Virginia counties during the 20th century. Though they might not have as far-reaching connections as the other Harrison lines, they are worth noting for their Northern Virginian influence. Perhaps at a future date we'll cover some of their historical impact in a different context. Regardless, by the time Abraham Lincoln came to power in 1861, Harrison power was a shell of its former glory. They left places like Wakefield, Berkeley, and Brandon behind in exchange for Indiana and Ohio. In so doing, when the conflict often called the Civil War erupted, the Harrisons found themselves outside of their ancestral South figuratively and literally. Sure, Harrisons still remained in Virginia, but leaders with ties to this impressive line fought for the North. They remain part of Virginia's deeply woven fabric, but they are also part of the United States tapestry as well, given their wide influence. We may not completely know their founding history, but we do know their wide historic impact, and for that reason, the Harrison name endures. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Virginia History Podcast. Please help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider and visit the show notes page for each episode. Those can be found at vahistorypodcast.com. 
Next, please consider supporting the work financially on Patreon. And perhaps you'd like some podcast merchandise, or maybe a one-time donation fits your budget best. Links for all of these possibilities can be found under the support tab on our podcast website. Other ways that also help out are liking and following us on social media. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash VA Hispod, and follow me on Instagram at Virginia History Podcast to see some of the statewide trips that I take for future episodes. I've also uploaded podcast episodes to YouTube. They can all be accessed by finding my channel at Robert Van Ness. If you haven't already, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Doing so increases visibility in the Apple Podcast Network, the largest podcast outlet on the Internet. Finally, tune in again next time as we continue our walk through Virginia's history. Do 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 do